What's up everyone, my name's Abi and welcome back to Slice of Pie. Today is my very first Mind Slice. And for those of you who know me, you'll know I'm pretty much obsessed with Maya Briggs. And it's all thanks to this guy here, Eric Thor. Um, thank you for joining me today, Eric. No, it's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to getting my mind spliced. <laughs> so basically, um, about three years ago, I was going through something of maybe an existential quarter life crisis. I was um, trying to figure out why I am the way I am, um, what I should be doing with my life and all of that. And so I have that once a week. <laughs> exactly. That's a, the intuitive curse, I believe. Yeah, so I found your videos and I I think that for Maya Briggs, it's something like a gateway drug for me. So Maya Briggs opened me up to psychology, which opened me up to like Jordan Peterson and then philosophy. And it just it's a whole web of things that opened up from that one interest I had. Um, we'll be talking a bit more about Jordan Peterson later. But first, tell me about your backstory. How did you come into this? So I came into the Myers-Briggs type indicator and that whole world uh, after I had a burnout. I used to be in politics and uh, wow. in politics I became quite a fake person. I adapted a social persona that wasn't really me. And uh, coming out of that, uh, I had drained myself and uh, really exhausted myself trying to be that way. And then I started thinking, but who am I really then? Like what is uh, underneath it all, okay? What, and then I started going back to who I was as a kid and uh, like rediscovering some of my passions for philosophy and for uh, figuring things out and for uh, studying the world and people. And uh, yeah, that became a big discovery for me. So the Myers-Briggs helped me uh, put words onto that process of going back into myself and uh, it also helped channel my enthusiasm for psychology and for understanding myself and other people. Mm -hmm. um, what you just described there, it does kind of sound to me a bit like you were relying a lot more on your extroverted feeling and then you started going back to your introverted feeling for authenticity. Is that what happened to you? Yeah, that's how I would have described it as well. Uh, extroverted feeling and extroverted sensing. I think uh, I had the come to adapt the belief that if I wasn't useful to other people, I had no value as a person. Oh, okay. And uh, for me, uh, and for most INFJs, extroverted feeling tends to represent the mission <laughs> you have to accomplish or the thing you have to uh, uh, succeed in but not necessarily something that you are naturally good at or not something necessarily easy for you. Mm -hmm. So it was something I had to constantly push forward and uh, uh, push myself to do, uh, even though it was uh, very difficult for me. Okay. Um, when it comes to the personality split of the, the geographics and the demographics around the world, I've noticed that intuitives occupy only about 30% on average and they were pretty much outnumbered by senses. And, but I also know that Maya Briggs isn't theoretically the most accurate scientifically from what I've heard. Um, Jordan Peterson himself thinks it's not that accurate. But I also noticed that when people talk about Maya Briggs, most of them don't know about the cognitive functions and the stacking. So one thing I've read is that a person's Maya Briggs type doesn't change over the course of their life. It's just that the development of their cognitive functions is different at different stages of their life. So sometimes they get mistyped as something else. Um, what do you think about that? So if you look at just the Myers-Briggs type indicator, you have to recognize that it's com almost completely arbitrary. Most of the 16 types and how they are defined and where their boundaries go, it's just been decided by somebody, not necessarily because uh, it is that way or because the brain works that way, but because it's practical and it can help uh, be useful for people looking for jobs and for people that are looking to get into uh, the, the, a new education or a new career. So. When you look at Carl Jung, however, I believe that you get something that is a bit more uh, rooted in something very real. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you look at neuroscience and when you look at the recent discoveries into the human mind, you can see that a lot of these networks uh, exist mm -hmm. and work in a way similar to what Carl Jung thought they did. Mm -hmm. So when he talked about feeling uh, what they talk about in neuroscience today is the default mode network. Uh, there's, it's said that there's a network in the mind that's used to process experiences and to reflect on social issues and people. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of the brain that is called the task positive network, which is about uh, more uh, the decision making or the logical reasoning or the more conscious uh, decision making process that you can go into. And that sounds a lot more like thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, you just brought up neuroscience, and I'm not sure if you've heard of Dr. Dario Nardi. 
but he has a book called The Neuroscience of Personality, of course you know about it. So basically um, he says how different cognitive functions basically are mapped to certain areas of the brain. Um, and I also wanted to go into quickly, we've talked about this before, but the mirror types. So um, let's go, we'll go into relationships actually. So <laughs> you're an INFJ, um, your girlfriend is an ENFP and everywhere I read online always says that's like the perfect pairing um, because they mirror each other's functions. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, so I believe that uh, the mirror pairing or the inspirational pairing that I call it uh, has become in modern days the most popular pairing and I see it in a lot of power couples and politicians uh, and uh, like celebrities and then uh, different parts of the world and in friendships, I see people that naturally tend to seek out an inspirational match. And I really do understand it in today's society. I think in the past, it was more important to have a true opposite, to meet somebody who was very opposite of you, who had different interests, different values, somebody that could ground you, uh, and somebody who could keep your back. But in uh, today's society where you have to be so self-reliant and so secure in yourself, I think you need an inspirational match. So today you're, you need a person that has similar values and passions to yourself, mm -hmm. somebody that uh, wants something very similar to you mm -hmm. uh, in order to create that ideal happy life, you know, where you can have uh, uh, the same amount of kids you want, uh, the same uh, place to live, or the same uh, passions or hobbies to engage in together, you know, a playmate as well as a partner. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also need somebody that can push you and uh, challenge you to grow. Exactly. And the inspirational pairing is definitely that, you know, when you date somebody who is just like yourself, like an INFJ, dating an INFJ, you do have that uh, empowerment mm -hmm. of having somebody who is like you mm -hmm. and that recognition, but you don't have that push of uh, can you see things differently? Can you think the way I do? Can you try to step outside your own shoes for a second? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's... And for that, you need an inspirational match. Okay, because um, I do know that those two aren't the only mirror pair. Every every type has its own mirror. Um, but I want to know whether the same thing applies to all of them, or is it just particular to... I believe so. Yeah? Okay, because I haven't actually heard so much about it, but I think that's also because the people who are more inclined to participate in these kind of conversations are the idealists, right? So we just probably don't hear as much about the other types. No, uh, I think the most material online is about, uh, when it comes to relationships, it's about NFs. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think that makes a lot of sense Definitely. because that's what we think about all the time. Yeah. Uh, but um, it's equally true, an ISTJ should definitely look for an ESTP if they are looking for a perfect mix of uh, a challenging match to uh, push you to try out new things and to go out outside yourself, but also a uh, person that will share your values and interests and motivations in life. Mm -hmm. So uh, as an ENFP, I should try to find an INFJ theoretically, although I do yes. know that any type can be with any other type. It is possible, of course. Definitely, definitely. But um, what, as an INFJ yourself, um, I've noticed that some INFJs can be a bit tough to come out of their shell. So do you have any tips for drawing out an INFJ? So I would say that a lot of time INFJs uh, are people that tend to share quite freely about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, INFJs tend to trust everyone they meet. And so naturally, because we trust other people, we can be quite open with other people. I know this, that I can share about my personal struggles and problems and my own thought process uh, very easily. And this is something that other people might even re react to, like that I'm oversharing or that I mm -hmm. actually... Uh, talk about myself in a way you're not expected to. I don't just say I'm having a good day. I say, oh, I'm a bit stressed today. Mm -hmm. And people don't expect you to say that. Yeah, you're uh, a bit more honest, I suppose, than people are used to. And uh, so I don't uh, agree with that stereotype of INFJs as, uh, uh, what should you say, uh, in their own shell or quiet or uh, refusing to share or open up to others. Okay. Well, I suppose you don't fall into that category, but let's say I do know some INFJs who do fall into that category and are a bit tough to crack. Um, what would you suggest would be a good way to, you know, connect with them better? So what I do notice is INTJs and INFPs are more reserved in general than INFJs. So uh, if you're looking at the most difficult type to get to open up, it's probably an INTJ or an INFP. Mm -hmm. uh, and regardless what strategy I would probably use is, uh, I would let them talk. So I wouldn't constantly keep the conversation going and because you know a lot of time you expect the conversation to be constantly going and to constantly be saying something but with an INFP or an INTJ it's uh, welcoming silence and letting them speak slowly mm -hmm. 
about something and uh, holding back that impulse to jump in and to just be silent for a few seconds longer because maybe they will say something else. Okay. And that's when the interesting stuff will start to come out. Yeah, that's, that sounds about right to me. Um, what I wanted to know as well, um, INFJs are said to be the most extroverted of the introverts, and ENFPs are also said to be the most introverted of the extroverts. So is that... Yeah, you can hear that stereotype, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, we're supposed to be very private, but at the same time, we're supposed to be very, the most extroverted. Yeah. So how does that work? Exactly. So that all comes down to the cognitive function. So I just thought maybe for the people who are watching this, maybe you could just give a quick rundown of the different cognitive functions and what they mean. Oh, so I believe there are 16 <laughs> cognitive functions, not just eight. Oh, okay. And uh, so I believe that uh, a cognitive function is a combination of an attitude and a value. So, uh, for example, introversion and intuition or intuition and judging or feeling and perceiving or extroversion and feeling. Okay. So. Uh, when I look at cognitive functions, you see this in my personality test as well, every question I ask is one of these 16 cognitive functions. And your personality type is, when you weigh all those together, uh, you get your personality type. Yeah, I did notice that with your personality test, I got for the first time in my life, I got tested as an INFP instead of an ENFP. So <laughs> that was a bit interesting as well. Yeah, so um, the test is not near perfect, especially the last update, I made the, I messed up one or two questions and it's enough to mess up one question to uh, mess up the entire test basically. Uh, so what I do now, uh, want to go back to is that, you know, what are the cognitive functions, that first question you asked. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at, for example, introverted intuition, what I see is uh, INFPs, INTPs, INTJs, INFJs, they all use introverted intuition as their flow function. And uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, they are more driven towards uh, uh, self-reflection and they're more driven towards uh, trying to figure things out. So often it's that they refuse to believe what they see around them and that they uh, go inside to find answers to what's happening around them. Mm -hmm. And then extroverted intuition? Extroverted intuition is, in many ways, uh, uh, finding energy in novelty, new things, becoming excited by potential, change, transformation. Uh, <laughs> I can see that in you, yes, definitely. Uh, it's not that an INFJ is not interested in novelty or that an ENFP is not uh, philosophical, mm -hmm. uh, but it's that INFJs tend to find it easy to engage in philosophy and to find answers by introspection, while an ENFP tends to find it more difficult, tends to become more puzzled. What is this? How do I make sense of all these strange things that are happening around me? Mm -hmm. A lot of time it's, uh, I see that for ENFPs, it's something you can never know for sure. It's all speculation, but INFJs, they tend to get pretty full on about their theories and they tend to become pretty convinced that they have figured it out. Mm -hmm. So every type has every cognitive function but they experience it differently and value it differently. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, because everyone is capable of thinking in every way, but some ways will just come more naturally to you, depending on your type. And there are different ways of looking at it. Some people say you should try to um, mitigate your deficiencies by focusing on what you're weak at and trying to get that more balanced. And obviously there's some merit in doing that. Um, but also when it comes to career and things like that, I believe to have the most chance of success in what you're doing, you should really try and focus on your strengths. Definitely, you should try to find a job or a career or a education that matches your passions and values. So you should not seek to be an accountant if you're an ENFP, for example. Uh, so uh, no matter though, uh, even if you go into architecture, for example, which is very much about transformation and change and uh, these uh, new designs and these new ways of building and all those extroverted intuitive things, mm -hmm you're still going to end up having to do a lot of uh, road work with introverted sensing. Mm -hmm. So no matter what passion you get, it's never going to be easy and you cannot only do what you love. Of course. And sometimes you're going to have to sit down and do the hard work and uh, work through the numbers and all those things that are annoying. That's true, but I suppose if you're focusing more on what you're passionate about, you're less likely to you know, be averse to doing the small little things here and there. As opposed to yeah. it feels the other way around where 80% of the time you're doing something you hate, then it's a different story. 
you hit the nail on the head there. Exactly. If uh, you know that it's a necessity in order to uh, bring about the vision or an idea you have, it's so much more worthwhile and feels so much more rewarding. And uh, that's also important when you use the inferior function, you need to get rewarded for it. You can't, uh, you don't intrinsically enjoy using it. It's not intrinsically easy. It's not something you can just flow out like you can with your dominant function. Uh, it's not fun in itself. So it's, you have to get rewarded for it. You have to get something back. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we're, so far we've gone through about a quarter of the way of the typical cognitive functions. Um, we've already gone through the two intuitions. Do you want to just quickly just run through the other six? Oh, definitely. So I made videos where I do it more in depth and more on the spot and where I try to get everything down. But uh, a short, starting with focusing on the extroverted and introverted uh, sensing. Uh, extroverted sensing is about attention. Uh, to what another person is saying or what is happening around you. It's about being aware of the people in your environment, what they are saying, what they are doing, what they look like. It is uh, taking an interest in other people, in what they have to tell, what stories they've done, what they've done in the day, where they come from, what they, uh, what's happening around them, what they think, what they like, what they do. So it's that person that has unbridled enthusiasm for you and what you are doing and where you come from and who you are and all those things about you. They're, they're going to be naturally interested in everyone and they also naturally mirror other people's body language. Mm -hmm. Introverted sensing types, they're people that like the introverted intuitives, they are introverted so their approach is on uh, the inner world and so they're more skeptical to what's happening around them. They're still interested in other people and in what their environment and their but they are people that are going to be more focused on details. They're going to be more focused on uh, adding up what you say. Does it make sense? Are you telling the truth? Uh, do you mean this? Uh, have I seen this before? They cross-check what you say to what their past experiences are. Mm -hmm. They look more at uh, what uh, they've learned and their past, past experience with the situation. They, they're definitely people that uh, value looking at uh, and learning from their past and from where they are from and their roots are very important to them. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the feeling, the sensing done, right? So now we got thinking and we got, what's the last one? Feeling. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So with feeling, uh, what you get is a person that is more focused on uh, either with extorted feeling, it's uh, about the people and about the values and it's about who you should, how you should act and who you should be and what you should do. Uh, extroverted feeling tends to focus more on the tribe and the introverted feeling more on the self. So introverted feeling types, they're more naturally introspective. They spend more time reflecting on who they are and who they should be and what they should do. Uh, while extroverted feeling types, they're more focused on what we should do together as a group and how we should act towards one another. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there's a misunderstanding that extroverted feelers, they follow the norms of a group mm -hmm. but in reality it's that they set the norms mm -hmm. so they are the people that's with somebody as doing something wrong they are the campaigners mm -hmm. so the people that try to put things right and to restore justice and to make sure everyone is uh, treating each other's right that everybody is uh, uh, following and acting in a way that they think is congruent with their ethics and their values mm -hmm. introverted feeling it's uh, much more focused on who am I supposed to be? What kind of person do I am? And there's more the law of, you know, treat others like you want to be treated. It's more a focus on uh, an extension of your own ethics and your own beliefs into the world. Mm -hmm. And finally, we're left with thinking, right? The two types of thinking. Yes. So with thinking, it's, and you hear this with everything I said, you can't define thinking in itself. Mm -hmm. There is no thinking type. Okay. But there are introverted thinking types and there are extroverted thinking types. Okay. So that's also one area where the Mars Briggs gets wrong. Mm -hmm. If you anything you say about the thinking type is a simplification, mm -hmm. being logical, being rational, even a feeling type can be rational. Yes. The question is where and when. Mm -hmm. So introverted thinking types they tend to uh, feel the most uh, motivation for when they go in and think, is this correct? It does this work? How does it work? Introverted thinking types, they're types that want to know how things work. So what are the principles of something? What are the workings of a tool or a system? How can I use it? How can I understand it? They want to get inside things. And that's introversion, getting inside things. Mm -hmm. uh, with extroverted thinking, it's uh, probably the most stereotypically rational process. It's the process that focuses on uh, how things work. 
yeah. what works and what doesn't work. It's pragmatic. So uh, it uh, follows and sees what strategies uh, seem to be successful and it discards and ignores those that don't seem to work. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Extroverted thinking is inclined to work in itself, and introverted thinking types are more inclined to want to understand and figure it out. Yeah, that sounds about right as well. <laughs> I'm the extroverted thinking type. So um, now we've gone through all the functions. Thank you for that. I hope whoever's watching this might have some kind of idea what resonates more strongly with them. Um, if you are watching this right now and you're, this is piquing your interest, I highly suggest you subscribe to Eric's channel. Um, it was, it's been very helpful for me. We're trying to figure out me as opposed to other people and um i do know like we mentioned before that jordan peterson has said that Meyer briggs isn't the most accurate testing mechanism um he's more familiar with the big five and i have done the big five test as well so um what kind of there has to be some kind of correlations there between the big five and Meyer briggs obviously extroversion and extroversion are related there um, when it comes to intu intuition and intuitives that's more correlated with the openness dimension isn't it yeah, so I've also looked at the big five and I've also been very interested in figuring this one out. And I also pick a lot of interest into Jordan Peterson's work. I do really admire the big five for having a scientific ambition in what it does. Uh, what I've noticed is uh, every one of the big five scales, uh, except neuroticism, correlates to one cognitive function in the Myers-Briggs type indicator. So it does seem to have... Uh, a relationship and that uh, both are trying to study the same phenomena. Mm -hmm. The problem is, or the difference is that the big five does so with more scientific rigor and that also means it becomes more boring <laughs> for a normal person. Yeah. What uh, happens is uh, it's more rote, it's more focused on uh, very, very practical and specific behaviors. Mm -hmm. So uh, liking to go to museums or <laughs> being a person that uh, reads a lot mm -hmm. or being a person that tends to uh, introduce themselves first to new people and to take social initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, when Big Five talks about outgoingness, that's not extroversion, for example. Uh, extroverts can be very shy mm -hmm. and don't have to be outgoing at all. Yeah. Some extroverts, they're people that like to study everyone around them, but prefer when other people initiate social interaction. So that's probably true for you as well. Yeah, many times, yes. <laughs> yeah, and that's true for most extroverted perceiving types. So. However, most uh, most extroverted judging types will probably say that they're very outgoing. Even at JAC and TJ, they'll all say that, yeah, I like me being the first to say hi and to introduce myself and to talk about my project or my idea or my passion or my goal. Oh, well, that, I do go through phases of that too. So I, like I said, uh, like you said, I suppose um, everyone can kind of associate with any kind of function. It's true. Everyone can. Um, so while we're on the subject of Jordan Peterson, um, I know you can't, it's really hard to type people you don't know, and so it's like, there's always a danger in doing that, but what type would you say he is? I would think he's he's more of a thinking type, for sure, because he's an intellectual, <laughs> and he's high in um, intuition, I would suppose, as well. Yeah, I type Jordan Peterson, and I made a video about this mm -hmm. as INTJ. Mm -hmm. uh, my video about Jordan Peterson was about his uh, tendency towards self-criticism as a means of bettering himself. And I note this a lot of INTJs, they are addicted to this thought process. How can I improve myself? How can I work better? How can I be smarter? Mm -hmm. It's not that INTJs are smarter than any other type, but it's that they spend more time trying to be smart mm -hmm. uh, than other types. And uh, obviously that hard work pays off. Mm -hmm. uh, so INTJs, they don't tend to accept themselves. And I see that in Jordan Peterson. He talks a lot about why should I accept myself? I might have lots of problems and character flaws. I should not accept myself. I should admit to my problems and I should work on them and I should improve myself. Yeah, that's basically his entire ethos of his self-help book and everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Not as good as you could be. And I, I totally agree with that, actually. I do, but I also come from another perspective, and I believe that uh, uh, people are too hard on themselves nowadays. Mm -hmm. I made a video just uh, earlier today, which uh, which I mentioned uh, uh, the ENTJ philosophy on this. And ENTJs, they are very different than this. ENTJs, they tend to accept themselves radically almost. Mm -hmm. They tend to believe themselves to be the best of the best in everything. I can do anything. I can do anything better than anyone else. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, I think there's something healthy in this as well. Uh, I think if you can boost yourself up and empower yourself and learn to not always be so hard on yourself, you can also be more relaxed and naturally you're going to do better because of it. Yeah, I suppose if you have less inhibitions to do something, you're more likely to do it. 
Yes, and the self-criticism of an INTJ can become completely debilitating. I mean, there's lots of INTJs that never get out of the swamp they <laughs> built for themselves. So they're constantly filled with self-doubt and self-criticism, and they're always thinking about everything that's wrong with them and everything they need to improve on, so they never do anything. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to Jordan Peterson, he's become something of a controversial figure, um, you might say. And I think it's because... Um, I think it's because he's kind of delved into the political side of things as much, but I also think that that's not really what he's trying to do and that's not what he's about. If you watch his other lectures about the psychology, about his um, psychological deconstruction of the Bible and all of that, I'm not, I'm not even religious, but I find there's great value in learning those kinds of things. Yeah, so what I see in uh, Jordan Peterson uh, as his flaw is that I don't think he is able to show a lot of empathy for people who think and see the world differently than he does. Yes. Uh, so he is very sure of himself yeah. and what he believes and that he is right. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're a person who is very sure of yourself and you put yourself out there in video uh, and you're a person that is also not very humble mm -hmm. to other people who see things differently, mm -hmm. uh, you can naturally become quite controversial. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that He's like this because he's a scientist, I suppose, and his whole philosophy is about telling the truth, right? And he he doesn't think, um, like you said, feelings of other people should get in the way of that. He just speaks what he believes to be the truth and then just come what may. Um, and I, yeah. I do believe that the, the certain people in society are not open to even hearing out people and they just want to shut them up and they want them to not be able to speak. And I do believe there's a great danger in the, that restriction of freedom of speech which John Pearson talks about a lot. Yeah, yeah, we don't listen to each other so nearly enough nowadays. Yeah. And we're so sure, we're so focused on what we want to say against the other person that we don't have time to listen to what they say. Yeah, because rule nine of his book is um, assume the person you're talking to knows something that you don't. And there's, there's always wisdom you can draw from any place. You just, you don't have to take the bad with the good, you know, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, that's a good rule for anyone who is struggling with a lot of conflicts in their life and struggling with cooperation and diplomacy and the connection with others. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing about Jordan Peterson, probably one of the biggest things I admire about him is just how articulate and eloquent he is just when he's talking off the top of his head. Like, it's hard for me to... I'm more of a writer, but when it comes to speaking, as you could probably tell over the course of this um, conversation, I can't. it's hard for me to sometimes put my thoughts into words, but he seems to have no problem with that at all. I wanted to know, um, would that be associated with any particular cognitive function, the way that he's able to do that? So his ability to speak with exactness, I think, is definitely a result of him having strong introverted thinking. Mm -hmm. And INTJs, they have strong introverted thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, not just strong introverted feeling, definitely strong introverted thinking as well. Beyond that, being able to uh, speak calmly and uh, in a detached manner about an issue from the bigger picture, mm -hmm. I think is a result of being an introverted intuitive. Mm -hmm. yeah, that does his, ability to, his ability to, beyond that, uh, be confident about what he says and to stand for his point even when pushed in a discussion with others, uh, I think comes from thinking judging. And his focus when he speaks, you know, when he gets talks about something, he is 100% focused on that topic. He doesn't change it to anything. He doesn't get distracted. Mm -hmm. He just keeps going and everything he says uh, adds up and connects to that point he's trying to make. Mm -hmm. And that just makes it so convincing mm -hmm. when you listen to it. It's so convincing. It's hard to resist the intuitive judging yeah. uh, because it's everything's leading up to the same point. There is nothing irrelevant. Yeah, it's like a focused laser beam. Um, when we're, while we're on the topic of um, articulate people, I'm not sure if you've um, seen Chris Turner before. He's a British comedian and he's a freestyle rapper. And the way his mind thinks, the way he makes connections between things, the way he's articulate and eloquent off the top of my head, I was thinking in some ways he's like Jordan Peterson, but at the same time he's, um, he's a lot more extroverted, I believe. He seems to be more um, empathetic as well. So I don't believe they would be sharing the same cognitive functions. I was thinking he might be an ENTP or something, but I'm not sure. I think you're right on the mark there. Uh, you actually told me to look at Chris Turner before this, mm -hmm. and uh, I actually did. Um, and I actually found him quite interesting, quite funny. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the recommendation. Yeah, no uh, I uh, do think he is an ENTP cool. uh, as well. Okay. Uh, so I think you're right on the mark there. I'll tell you how I tie people. Uh -huh. uh, 
I type people, when I type people, I triangulate. So I put them in a spectrum of three types. Mm -hmm. And then I see which type comes in the middle. Okay. A lot of time, for example, for this, it would be either he would be an ENFP, an ENTP, or an ENTJ. Yeah. Um, and that would be the only three I could have considered for him. Okay, and uh, however, what puts him in the ENTP spot is uh, uh, you can see the enthusiasm when he speaks about something. And ENTJs and ENFPs, they all have that. So I think that's his strongest function, extroverted intuition. Mm -hmm. that's and all three have that. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you can see as well the positivity. Mm -hmm. And positivity is a key sign for ENTPs when you compare them to any of the other intuitives, mm -hmm. uh, extroverted intuitives. ENTPs are uh, not afraid of uh, positive feelings, uh, but they are definitely afraid of negative ones. They really struggle with uh, uh, people who are moody or people who are depressed or people who are down, and they don't like to when things are negative. So they try to always share people up and keep people happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did get that vibe from him, <laughs> for sure. So there was one thing I wanted to bring up as well, um, the importance of learning the Maya Briggs. I know it's not for everyone, but like I said, for me, it's kind of changed my life um, just for helping me realize what my strengths are, what my weaknesses are, and just trying to aligning my path forward along those, those guiding lines. Um, I, and what a lot of people will have noticed when they're talking to me is one of the first things I do is try to either guess their Maya Briggs type or have them like work through it with me. And I suppose the, one of the reasons I do that is because I believe that if it can have that same effect of them being like a gateway to them, maybe they can turn their life around in a way that they didn't foresee and you know make something of themselves. So uh, what I wanted to know is, what do you believe my breeze can have that same kind of salutary effect on most intuitives or people in general? And and why you decided to kind of like pursue this so strongly? So. At its worst, the Myers-Briggs can be terrible. At its best, it can be amazing. Uh, at its worst, it can lead to people clinging to a false sense of identity or an uh, inflated sense of identity. It might be that you type accurately, but it might still be that you have a stereotypical idea of what that means and a limiting belief uh, that keeps you from growth. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the way I try to do typology and the, Mars and the way I try to use it uh, I have been able to get extreme value for my own personal growth and my own self-insight. You know, it's crazy. A lot of people live without any form of self-reflection. They never reflect on their actions or who they are and what they do. Uh, and I think that can uh, be so difficult and so dangerous in today's society because in today's society, everybody's telling you, do this, get that education, earn money, be live that life. Everyone is telling you what to do and how to live. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people end up living fake lives fake relationships, fake lives, you know. Uh, they have a job they don't like, they have a partner they don't like, or they have a partner they like, but they cannot talk to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or they have a job they would enjoy, mm -hmm. but they are unable to set boundaries for themselves or to get any joy from it because they are unable to understand it or themselves. So what's the value? The value is figuring out what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I would also say that there are stereotypes obviously involved with all of the types um, and so I have tried to be more open-minded um, in terms of like people getting to know people there, there's always that um, kind of the stereotype that intuitives and senses can be very hard for them to connect with each other on like a on an existential level I suppose that's not a stereotype yeah um, <laughs> but like like we also said that every type is capable of thinking in every way but like you, yeah, yeah. But I have found it to be true that it is very hard for me as an intuitive to really connect strongly with someone who's a sensor. It's definitely true that there are language barriers between sensors and intuitives. But the stereotype it's that sensors are, because of these language barriers, somehow stupid or less able than intuitives, mm -hmm. and that intuitives are some kind of superhuman citizens or something like that. Uh, in reality, I found that sensors are better than intuitives in a wide range of things. And depending on what definition of intelligence you have, sensors might even come out on top of intuitives. Like uh, you can see that sensors are people that uh, ex feel more certain about, of themselves. They experience less doubt mm -hmm. in themselves. They are more strong in their own identity, more secure in themselves and who they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, they are more secure in what they believe and in the facts and what's right and wrong. Mm -hmm. So while intuitives uh, can be people that uh, often start out quite uh, good in school and learn quickly and so on, what I've noticed is intuitives tend to lack resilience mm -hmm. and hard work. 
<laughs> so uh, they tend to drop off in school. They tend to not finish their studies. They tend to get sidetracked very easily. Uh, they cannot commit to a field. Uh, they dart back and forth between careers. You know, all those things that, uh, that can really make it difficult uh, for an intuitive to be successful. Mm. Well, I suppose we need um, different strokes to make the world turn. We do. And uh, what the intuitives need to awaken to is that they are more sensing than they think. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have areas in their lives where they are very sensing. So as an ENFP, there are going to be areas where you are stronger in sensing than you think. And uh, you don't, people don't recognize these things. They think they are 90 or 100% intuitive. Uh, but in reality, they are not. <laughs> They're closer to the middle than they think. Okay, that's interesting to know. All right, so I think um, I've covered everything that I wanted to. Um, was there anything else you wanted to mention? Yeah, I just want to say uh, uh, it's been a blast being here. Oh, thanks, Eric. And, uh, Thank you for being yeah, here. Yeah, it's been a really fun conversation. Uh, I had some questions for you. Just okay. uh, uh, my key question is, how's it going with the channel now and everything? Oh, it's a bit, it's a bit slow um, trying to get traction because um, I suppose having such a scattershot approach and doing so many different things, it's hard to kind of um, build a niche. But that's not really the point of my channel, and I have a bigger long-term purpose with it, which will eventually pay off in the end, hopefully. But um, I just need some help, I suppose, growing. Yeah, I would just say uh, experiment. So consider this an experimentation phase for you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, let the viewers come later. Yeah, I'm just focusing on <laughs> what I enjoy doing. Yeah. Uh, do you, have you had any videos that you really enjoyed more than anything else? Um... I feel like all of them serve a purpose in their own way. Like I like movies and TV shows, so I review them. I like tech, so I review that. Um, my, with my fitness one, that was more of a way for me to keep myself accountable to like stay in good shape and hopefully help other people get in better shape as well. Maybe either by inspiring them or by letting them know what worked and didn't work for me so that they can maybe try the same thing. So uh, like I said, it's a very uh, rounded approach to try doing to try and do a lot of different things. Well, I really like what you're doing, and it sounds like it's really helpful for you as well. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, so everyone who's watching this right now, um, I would highly recommend you do the My Briggs test. Eric F. also has a really amazing website where he divides his own personality tests with the Enneagram and all of that. So um, I highly recommend you go to check out his website, subscribe to his channel. Uh, he's also got a Discord community as well, which is um, full of like-minded people, which I found um, very um, what's the word I'm looking for? Comforting in some ways. So um, yeah, you should definitely check that out. I'll link all of those links below. Um, I'll also link the Big Five Personality Test by Jordan Peterson. Um, I found that to be very helpful for me as well. And last but not least, I'll also link one of Chris Turner's videos. And if I'm very lucky, I'll actually be able to confirm with him himself what his type is. And um, we'll see how that goes. So I uh, hear there's going to be a lot of links downstairs. Yeah. Uh, so you're definitely dealing with an ENFP here. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> all right, thanks so much, Eric, for joining me today. Um, it's been an honor. And thanks. I look forward to continuing to watch all your videos. All right, bye. Wow. <laughs> that was it. Oh, yeah. That was nice. <laughs>